Is the war in Ukraine about to take a major turn presenting the beginning of the end, or even worse, a dangerous escalation? Will China successfully form an anti-Western pole with Russia, Afghanistan, India, and countries hostile to the West? What does the Super El Nino mean to us? And the latest on the health of the global economy are all part of today's Preppers News segment. Plus, we're going to announce the winner of our last video's giveaway, and we're going to tell you how you can enter this video's giveaway. So let's go ahead and dive in. Russia. The world waits for a Ukrainian counteroffensive, which Ukraine's prime minister said on Friday would happen in the near future. Now, very few people, even in Ukrainian leadership, really know precisely when that counteroffensive is set to take place. But however, Russia is bracing for the attack, having built three defensive layers along the possible front line in the Zafiria province and hundreds of miles of fallback trenches to hold the line in Crimea and the Russian eastern border. Now, the much anticipated front line of this offensive is in the direction of Militopol because this would sever Russia's land connection between the occupied regions of the Donbass and the Crimea. So what's the delay? Part is the supply of promised weapons and the training of forces by the West. Ukraine has over a dozen brigades, nine of which have been thus far supplied with Western assets, including 200 tanks, 800 other armored vehicles, and 150 pieces of field artillery. Now, these armaments are dispersed throughout Ukraine to avoid concentrating them for Russian to target. It is still unknown whether they will be used in a large-scale orchestrated attack or through a series of deceptive, small focus attacks. Now, these smaller attacks would serve to really confuse the Russian targeting cycle and provide cover for a larger offensive. But still, the armaments and the weapons flow into Ukraine. And a third of the Western supply brigades are due to be fully equipped and trained at the end of April. And right now, Italy is sending 30 M109L self-propelled howitzers to Ukraine. And several days ago, a long convoy of these howitzers was filmed at the Udine railway station in Italy. Now, 60 have already been delivered, representing just a fraction of what other countries have already sent. Slovakia has handed over all 13 MiG-29 fighter jets it has pledged to Ukraine. And while part of the delay is getting the assets in place and the counteroffensive plan despite intelligence leaks, Part is that the ground is still too muddy for heavy equipment to move through effectively. The end of April or the beginning of May is really a better time frame. It may also be a factor of rigid Soviet-era generals too. And as Russia literally digs in the trenches, plants mines, and concentrates its forces in a defensive posture, Ukraine has offered an opportunity to circumvent these forces with smaller exchanges and draw the Russian troops out to different areas to defend. Now, Ukraine cleverly used the same tactic in last summer's first counteroffensive in the Kherson to distract from a surprise attack in Kharkiv in the east. Whichever assault occurs around the end of April, it may be Ukraine's final chance at a sustained counteroffensive. And while Ukraine hopes to regain all of its former areas, many Western countries hope that Putin and his generals will be beaten enough to result in a voluntary retreat as they did from the west bank of the Dnieper River in Kherson province in November. Now, this may be why Russian forces have dug trenches and put up defenses far from the front lines. The front line may be far from what Russia expects. Ukrainian drone attacks across Ukraine's northern border have rocked the Belgorod region of Russia and left thousands without power. Belgorod is 22 miles from Ukraine's northern border and far from the most active front lines. Wherever the counteroffensive will be, it will require the defense of 1,226 mile border between Ukraine and Russia. And it may not be where Russia expects and is digging into its defenses. And when the counteroffensive does occur, the front line of the conflict in Ukraine will feature approximately 35,000 Ukrainian soldiers backed by Western battle tanks confronting over 140,000 enemy troops. Though outmatched with personnel, the estimates show Russia has lost almost twice as many men as Ukrainians since the full-scale invasion began. Now, the leader of Russia's Wagner private mercenary group is warning in a recent essay that Ukraine's planned counteroffensive will likely succeed against Russian forces. And because of the recent battlefield losses, the Wagner group needs to use its elite forces in more combative situations. In an old communist style, he blamed the likelihood of a successful Ukrainian counteroffensive not on the Ukrainian forces' resolve or the Russian army's weaknesses, but on the deep state and the decadent elite. And while acknowledging a possible Ukrainian victory, he urged Russians to keep fighting despite a potential loss. He wrote, if Russia gets to the bottom, then it will push off from there, float back up like a huge sea monster, demolishing everything in its path, including the plans of the United States. 
Now, according to a group of former senior diplomats and high-level military advisors from both sides of the Atlantic, the war in Ukraine is headed towards a stalemate unless the Western nations increase their military support significantly. The group insists that going all in with military assistance is really necessary to achieve a favorable outcome in the conflict. In other news, on a different front in this conflict, Finland, NATO's newest member, has broke ground and began constructing its border wall with Russia. The three-meter-high steel fence with a barbed wire extension on top is to prevent illegal immigration from Russia and give reaction time to authorities. Russian tactics in the past have been to infiltrate other countries and disrupt from within, which we have seen in Crimea and Moldova. In 2015 and 2016, Moscow attempted to influence Finland by organizing large numbers of Middle Eastern asylum seekers to mass at northern Finnish crossing points in the Arctic Lapland region. And the pilot section of the fence is scheduled to be completed by this summer. Now, the barrier will eventually be extended to 200 kilometers throughout the more hospitable southeast region. Air surveillance will monitor all the northern regions. In other news, the G7, or Group of Seven, they've agreed to keep Russian oil at the controlled lower price of $60 per barrel. Now, coalition officials concluded the price cap was working to limit Russian revenue while maintaining energy market stability. And Russian crude exports have been consistent at over 3 million barrels per day, and global markets have been relatively steadily supplied despite the sanctions. As we reported in an earlier video, Russian exports of liquefied natural gas have actually increased by 20%. Also, five of the G7 countries have agreed to squeeze Russia out of the international nuclear fuel market. This plan is to use the agreement for foundation for expelling the Russian Federation entirely from the nuclear fuel market, aiming to achieve this as expeditiously as possible. And as we also reported earlier, many companies have stepped up to provide nuclear fuel for reactors to replace Russian fuel. Look, let's put the politics aside for a moment. Everyone in the world knows we have a fossil fuel problem. And I only bring this up because whether you view your fossil fuel coming from the angle of economics, dependence on foreign nations, pollution, or saving the planet, our dependence on these commodities has sparked wars in recent years and has been really used as a serve as a tool to create leverage over other countries. Reducing our reliance on energy from fossil fuels and switching over to renewables, it's not going to happen overnight. I know that. But as many challenges as it does have, namely our infrastructure is just not set up for a system like this at this time, but with all the things that we have to consider, the economic incentive ultimately will drive conversion. That's true in all situations. And it's now cheaper in the majority of cases to stand up solar or wind harvesting than rely upon fossil fuels for energy. We're clearly at a tipping point in the coming years of switching over. And again, I realize there's a lot of hurdles. I don't just say this flippantly or dismissing this, you know, the, the sheer reality of having to build an infrastructure to sustain renewable energies, but sheer economics is really driving the innovation. And like any technology, it only improves and gets cheaper with time. So I say all this because we're watching as Russia is still continuing to export oil, which is now at pre-war export levels, but it's at a lower price per barrel, about 45%. It really shows how difficult it is to inflict sanctions in an energy-dependent world. Now, perhaps this conflict would be over if all the valves were shut off the day Russia invaded its neighbor. OPEC Plus cutting production to keep the price elevated during a global recession as the world teeters on the brink of war is really nothing short of intentional price manipulation to help Russia and line their own pockets. But sadly, the pace of this conflict has been tied up to the energy industries. Now, at first, there was a vocal ban on Russian oil, but a shadowy fleet sprung up to circumvent these sanctions. And fearing a cold weather and following the Nord Stream pipeline explosion, Russia has actually sold 20% more liquefied natural gas. Wars are often fought with resources as a weapon and over-resources. New energy deals have been inked between Russia and the countries of China and India, which have made up for the loss of revenue from other countries. Now, so long as energy consumption is a factor, this conflict will continue instead of racing to a hasty conclusion. And in my opinion, energy is a prep that doesn't really get enough attention but has greatly fascinated me personally. When you are entirely beholden to corporations or municipalities for your energy needs, you must be in lockstep with those entities that often prefer profits over citizens. That's just a reality. I would encourage you to give attention to your emergency energy needs so that you're not dependent 
on these companies in a post-disaster climate. And I've got several videos on solar setups that you can go and check out on my channel from DIY to different options on the market. I just did my annual comparison video of the different portable solar generators that you can look at. Uh, and I'm going to be doing several other videos in the coming months going from simple setups, DIY setups to whole home solar integrations. So that's my rant for today on energy. So what do you think? Is the Ukraine counteroffensive about to start? Will it be covertly supported by NATO and the Western allies? And will it be where Russia expects or will Ukraine shock the world? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. China. As someone from a developing nation put it to the former U.S. Treasury Secretary, what we get from China is an airport and what we get from America is a lecture. It's a telling and troubling statement as China continues to try and project itself as a peacemaker and a literal bridge builder while casting the United States as a dollar-wielding war and policy wager. Now, the United States and the old European order have placed unprecedented sanctions on Russia in response to the Ukraine war. Still, the Russian economy continues because many countries, including significant economies like China, India, and Brazil, they've all kept trading with Russia. China and the BRICS nations have not sought to decrease their trade with Russia. Instead, they have merely sought to transact in currencies other than the dollar. And this is giving rise to a second economy led in large part by China. And a quick side note here. If you haven't watched Ray Dalio's Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order on YouTube, I highly recommend that you go check that out after watching this video. I've referenced it several times in the past to get a glance of what's coming next on a global order. And I even bought the book and I'm currently reading it. It's a very fascinating read. I'm also currently listening to Peter Zahn's audio book, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, and both really give an interesting insight into where we're at now, explaining why these tectonic shifts are happening and how to prepare for what comes next. Ray Dalio's video on the subject, it's 43 minutes long and probably is one of the most insightful videos I've ever seen on YouTube. Anyways, Russian President Vladimir Putin, he met with the Chinese Defense Minister Li Shangfu in Moscow this last weekend. Both men held military cooperation between the two nations, which have declared a no-limits partnership. Now, China's role thus far in the Ukraine conflict has been confirmed to trying to maintain neutrality in the public eye while supplying third-party entities to trickle armaments and equipment into Russian hands. Now, the question really comes down to how long Russia and China can hold out and cultivate a following of developing nations already somewhat bristling at what they feel is an excessive Western influence. Unlike the West, China is openly willing to deal with any nation, regardless of its hostilities towards neighboring countries or its own people, if profit is to be had. And just last week, for example, a Chinese company offered $10 billion to the Taliban for access to lithium deposits. Now, while many have dismissed this possibility, we brought this up on the channel well over a year ago. Since the Taliban's return to power, China has expanded its economic ties with the Taliban, with Chinese companies offering investments in Afghanistan. And earlier this year, a Chinese company signed a $540 million deal to extract oil from northern Afghanistan. Now, the United States has not formally recognized the Taliban or any entity as the government of Afghanistan, has halted reconstruction efforts since the Taliban came to power, and is focused solely on providing humanitarian assistance instead of any reconstruction efforts to prevent the complete collapse of Afghanistan. Which strategy wins at the end of the day, one that turns a blind eye to the atrocities and pumps millions into developing and rebuilding the economy, or one that merely provides humanitarian aid? That question must be answered before anyone can honestly know how effective China's efforts are to form a new global polar opposite to the West. But so far, the West is showing few cracks and has yet to significantly fracture as Putin and Xi would have hoped for. Even France is walking back Macron's comments on not wanting France to be a vassal of the United States and encouraging neutrality in the Taiwan conflict. After President Macron's contentious remarks on China and Taiwan, during his state visit to Beijing, the French parliament intends to dispatch two delegations to Taiwan this month, a move that has both drawn criticism both domestically and internationally. The French president has doubled down on his statement saying that Paris supports the One China policy. It's a policy that would also have Taiwan as part of China. Now, the USS Milius, an Aegis-guided missile destroyer, made news last week by selling in proximity to a Chinese man-made military installation on the disputed Low Tide Atoll Mischief Reef. Now, this week, that same ship sailed through the Taiwan Strait, 
the 97 nautical mile water separating the island from the nation of Taiwan and from China. U.S. forces transect the contested waters of the strait at least once per month, and Chinese forces monitor them as they travel through it. And China has never renounced using force to bring democratically governed Taiwan under its control. Taiwan's government rejects China's territorial claims and says only the island's people can decide their future. And as we reported in our earlier video, we aren't likely to see things in this area get too far out of control so long as BRICS does it rise to a level where it supplants European and Western consumers of Chinese goods. Understanding this, the presidential candidate for Taiwan's ruling Democratic Progressive Party, William Lei, said on Saturday that war over Taiwan would bring about a global catastrophe. Now, Lei formally became the party's presidential candidate this week. And after two terms in office, Taiwan's current president is constitutionally barred from running again in next January's election. Now, the opposition party favors closer ties with China, so we will monitor the election leading up to January to see if there will be any changes in the coming months. Really, the wrench in China's plans may be its long-standing shaking peace with its neighbor of almost 1.4 billion people, which is India. They are loosely tied together through BRICS, and Russia has been inking as many deals with both nations as it can to buy their passivity, if not allegiance, to their cause. But the U.S. has emerged as India's biggest trade partner so far in 2023. The bilateral trade between India and the United States has increased by 7.65% to $120 billion. Now, despite their distrust of each other and their history of border conflicts, China has traditionally been India's top trading partner since roughly 2013. The shift of India to the United States may keep a polar opposite to Western influence from fully forming. What do you think? Is China going to form an anti-American and anti-European polar extreme successfully? Or have their efforts run their course? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Giveaway. For this week's giveaway, we're going to be giving away potassium iodide tablets. And to be eligible for a chance to win in this giveaway, just simply post a comment below and click the like button. And for the next video later this week, I'll use a tool to draw a winner from the comments on this video randomly. Now, for the last video's winner of the five pack of permanent matches, the winner is the subscriber Tom Rich Guy. And I'll reach out to you shortly to get that sent to you. U.S. Economy. As we reported in our breakout video on the health of the United States economy, the Fed has now acknowledged what we all knew, that a recession is inevitable. As if on cue, numbers are reflecting that reality now. Retail sales fell more than expected in March as consumers cut back on purchases of motor vehicles and other big ticket items. Ebbing demand for goods is undercutting production at factories, with further data on Friday showing that manufacturing production declined last month. Now, combating inflation is perhaps the most aggressive industrial revitalization program since the Industrial Revolution. Companies have committed more than $200 billion to U.S. manufacturing projects since Congress passed sweeping subsidies last year, as President Joe Biden's efforts to spark a new industrial revolution gains momentum. But however, these projects are in the early phases of ramping up, so they will have a minimal impact on the realities in the short term. And really, any positive economic gains from the Inflation Reduction Act or the Chips and Science Act, both designed to break U.S. dependence on Chinese supply chains, won't be really realized for several years to come. Last month, the EU unveiled a rival industrial strategy last month with provisions to match subsidies for projects at risk of going abroad. And there's a restructuring of economies occurring from Washington to London to Brussels to Tokyo. This will inevitably prolong the U.S. recession as it really coalesced under a new supply chain built around newly forged economic partnerships. Now, the significant factors determining whether this recession is the hoped for soft landing or the feared hard landing is going to be really corporate profits, consumers' confidence in spending, and the jobs data. And the longer the fear of a coming recession happens before we are in the depths of it, the longer corporations can adjust their expectations and margins, and consumers can brace for it. U.S. consumer sentiment inched up in April, even as households expected inflation to rise over the next 12 months. Jobs have slowed, but they still have remained strong. And even as inflation increases and makes everything more expensive, including prepping, you can expect that some deals to be had as companies continue to attempt to really downsize overstocked inventories or otherwise realign their business practices. Now, the reluctance by businesses to accumulate more inventory could also exert downward pressure on GDP growth. This will drive the economy down further. Policymakers at the U.S. Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of England openly acknowledge the significant uncertainty surrounding their projections as they continue to raise interest rates. 
there's also a recognition that there may be a need to do more than anticipated in response to unforeseen risk. It is generally agreed, however, that the central banks are mostly at or close to their peak interest rates. And from here, a more wait and see approach will be adopted while they focus on whatever other tools are available to really contain inflation and pump the brakes on the recession. So what do you think? Is inflation hitting you hard? Are we amidst a recession or have we not seen the start of it yet? In our video released this week, we are clear about how bad this recession will get and what you can do to prep against it. You might want to check that out. We released it, I believe, last Sunday. I'll also link to it in the description and comments section below. Let us know your thoughts as well in the comments below. World weather. Europe kicked off the year with a record-setting heat wave in midwinter, and ocean surface temperatures have hit all-time highs this month, breaking every record since satellite measurements began in the 1980s. Now, admittedly, less than half a century of data is a little to go on, but we can glean the magnitude of even a few degree temperature rise in the ocean from other records. And as we will dive more in depth in a coming video, La Nina is receding and we are entering into the El Nino cycle once again with these historically warmer ocean temperatures. Now, the erratic weather patterns, they really create problems for farmers in their efforts to maintain stable food production. We've seen, for instance, farmers losing whole crops of lettuce and strawberries or having to delay planting because of inclement weather patterns. The wetter weather in some areas will create a climate conducive to insect infestation and plant pathogens, even as sudden extreme droughts and heat waves decimate crops in other areas. So what do you think? What's your forecast? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Whether it's an ever-increasing world war, a new rising axis of anti-Western nations, tectonic shifts in economies, or ever more extreme weather patterns, the need to prepare will be increasingly more apparent to the masses. As a prepper watching this video right now, you need to stay ahead of these masses if you hope to get what you need in place to really survive to better days or thrive through the rest of the bad days. And I don't pretend to have a clear and certain picture of the future from some unique source or some crystal ball. And like you, I'm looking at the signs and indicators I see and it's enough to port in that the need to prep has never really been greater. We're gonna continue to monitor these things and hope you will delve into our video library and playlist to really get your prepping efforts to where they need to be. And one thing is for sure, the world is changing. So we have to change how we live our lives in response to that. And I believe prepping is the primary solution at this point. As always, stay safe out there.